Okay, we'll get started. So good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight to discuss the removal of police officers, school resource officers from Maryland schools. My name is Carolyn Larry, and I work as a project director for Racial Justice Now, DMV chapter. I'm your moderator for the evening, and I am um, looking forward to our conversation about this important issue. This evening, we will, we will provide a brief overview of the issue, where we stand on it, and why. We will hear from Marylanders about their experiences with police officers in schools. We'll we hear from two state delegates, Delegate Acevedo, and Delegate Wilkins about the respective bills they are sponsoring related to this issue. And we will have time at the end for questions. Before we get started, I'd like to introduce Monisha um, to hear a little bit about our coalition uh, very briefly. Um, and you will hear more from her later on this evening during our question and answer section. I'll turn it over to you, Monisha. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Monisha Charial. I'm an attorney with the Public Justice Center, but I'm really glad to be here on behalf of um, two statewide coalitions um, that have really thrown their support um, behind um, strategies to get police out of our schools and instead get, expand student mental health services, wrap around supports, and restorative approaches, all strategies which we know meaningfully keep students safe. Um, I'm, I'm proud to be representing um, the, the two coalitions that I refer to, the Maryland Coalition for, um, to Reform School Discipline, um, which is dedicated to ensuring that we deal with student behavior issues in a constructive manner um, that really teaches students and keeps them in school and out of the school to prison pipeline, as well as the Maryland Co Coalition for Justice and Police Accountability, which has put forward five demands for police reform in the legislature this coming session. Um, um, and one of those is to um, ensure that we get police out of our schools and pursue more effective strategies for keeping our classrooms safe. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you very much to uh, Carolyn as a fellow member of our coalition for facilitating the conversation this evening. Um, you will be hearing a lot of individual stories as well as sort of the, the larger um, context around data and policy, um, which is where we stand now. And, and uh, hopefully that provides a groundwork from where we can move. Thank you, Manisha. So uh, I would like to start this conversation with, with a little bit of framing and um, sharing our position and why we have our position. Um, so as a coalition, we support removing police officers, which are school resource officers from schools. While some students have had positive experiences with SROs, many have not. And we know that in the 2018-2019 school year, black students made up 56% of the arrests in schools while only counting for a third of the student population. This is really stark given that there are no differences in behaviors across race. And so again, I wanna say that again um, and really share that there are no differences in behaviors across race, even though uh, black students are getting arrested at higher rates, the, the, the behaviors that we are seeing are not different across race. We also know that 23% of students arrested had IEPs, even though they are only 12% of the student population. Most of the arrests made were for offenses like disruption or drug possession, um, disrespect, trespassing, fighting without a weapon, and smoking, all behaviors that we commonly see in schools and can be easily mitigated with interventions that do not lead to the school to prison pipeline. As Maryland has the highest arrest rate for black men and boys in the country, we support alternatives to having police in schools that focus on addressing trauma, building relationships, and facilitating healthy youth development. While many people feel that having police in schools makes schools safer, studies have indicated that their presence has not stopped school shootings or decreased school violence. So because of the disproportionate arrest rates of black students and other students of color, the trauma of having police in school for students, particularly students of color, and the financial, emotional, and mental impact that a student arrest has on the student and the student's family, we understand this to be a racial justice issue. So as we learn more about the impacts from our speakers and our panelists, um, thank you all very much for, for spending your evening with us and sharing these stories. 
uh, we expect, we ask that you consider the multiple impacts that, are, that having police in our schools has on Maryland community members. So we'll get into the speakers and then afterwards we will, um, I'm sorry, first we will hear from uh, the delegates and then we will hear from our speakers. And then after that, we will have question and answer. So I will ask um, if Delegate Acevedo is on the call, if he's joined so far, we would like to hear from you first. Hi, can you hear me? Perfect. Um, Welcome, thank you for coming. <laughs> thank you very much, Carolyn. Um, and good evening, everyone. And thank you to the members of the coalition. Uh, thank you to the Public Justice Center and for everyone who is not only engaged in this issue, but recognize, um, and rightly so, and I want to appreciate you, um, you know, just uh, uh, lift up your comments, uh, Carolyn, about framing this as a racial justice issue, um, because it very much is, and it's very much related to the discussion around police reform and accountability, um, because this is about uh, police in schools. It's about the criminalization of Black, Latinx, LGBTQ+, and students with disabilities. Um, and it's also a discussion about the school-to-prison pipeline. Oftentimes, we talk about uh, dismantling or ending the school-to-prison pipeline, but absent from that conversation uh, is the role that um, SROs, school resource officers, or cops play uh, in perpetuating that school to prison pipeline uh, and creating this pipeline that siphons Black, Latinx, LGBTQ plus and student, students with disabilities uh, from the classroom to the jailhouse. And so the legislation that Delegate Wilkins and I will be introducing uh, not only is um, legislation that uh, incorporates the concerns of uh, impacted communities uh, but also uh, centers the budgetary discussion about uh, where these funds are allocated and where it can be better spent. Um, and so the legislation that I'll be introducing will repeal uh, the school resource officers program uh, and uh, the complementary legislation that we'll be working on with Delegate Wilkins uh, and advocates uh, is to ensure that we are putting uh, the dollars uh, uh, you know, and investing it in the proven solutions that will keep our children uh, safe and that will keep us safe um, as a community. And so um, that requires uh, the engagement and the advocacy, not just of impacted communities, but people who recognize that the data uh, is just uh, too shocking uh, not to act. Um, you know, in my county, in Montgomery County, uh, a couple of months ago, a report was released by the Office of Legislative Oversight uh, that showed that Black students accounted for a fifth of enrollment in Montgomery County public schools, uh, yet accounted for over half of all of its arrests. If we look at neighboring jurisdictions like Charles County and Prince George's County, Baltimore County and Baltimore City, uh, and, and really across the state, we continue to see these really shocking numbers. And so as public policymakers, um, and really as members of the community, we have a responsibility to not just wrestle and confront that data, but to also listen to impacted communities, which is why we're all here this evening, to listen to those stories, to listen to those experiences, um, but also to learn about what it is that we need to do uh, to, uh, to, to, to make police-free schools a reality, uh, but also to dismantle the school-to-prison pipeline. So the legislation I'll be introducing, I ask folks to just uh, continue to be engaged and to pay attention um, it's going to be a very, very um, a different session, um, and we have to ensure that we're centering those impacted, the concerns of our babies and our communities, and pursuing the policies that will really keep them safe, and we know what those policies are, um, which is, you know, more nurses in our schools, we need counselors, we need social workers, we need behavior specialists. Um, and we also need better paid educators and paraeducators, right? These are the solutions uh, to keeping our kids safe um, and ensuring that we're building um, a healthy uh, school environment that would allow all of our kids to thrive. So thank you all very much. Um, I'm really excited to fight alongside each and every one of you all to make this a reality. Uh, it is a racial justice issue. It is very much relevant to the police reform conversation 
that we are having right now in Maryland as well as nationally. It's unfortunate that the work group did not uh, look at the issue of police free schools, um, but it's very much related. And that's why we are all here as a community and as advocates. Um, Audrey Lord so rightly put it, without community, there is no liberation. And so each and every one of us have a role to play in dismantling that school to prison pipeline and ending the criminalization of Black, Latinx, LGBTQ+, and students with disabilities. So thank you all very much. Thank you to the advocates. Thank you to the members of the coalition. Um, and of course, I'll hand it off to my esteemed colleague, who I'm proud to fight with in the social justice trenches to ensure that we're protecting all of our babies, uh, Delegate Janelle Wilkins. Thank you so much, Delegate Acevedo, and thank you everyone for being a part of this conversation and this fight. And I want to thank the Public Justice Center, Racial Justice Now, and the entire coalition for bringing Delegate Acevedo and I in with the honor of leading um, this legislation in the upcoming session. Again, I'm Delegate Janelle Wilkins. I represent District 20, which is the Silver Spring, Tacoma Park, and White Oak area in Montgomery County. Um, I I am on the Ways and Means Committee, which actually um, deals with issues of education in the House of Delegates. We also cover issues dealing with election law, taxes, um, and gambling as well. So um, we believe that these bills will come to the committee that I sit on and we're going to fight really hard um, to get them passed. Something that comes to mind every time I think about and work on the issue of school resource officers and having police free schools is this visit that I had to a school in my district where when I was meeting with the principal, he was stressed and he was trying to problem solve and he was talking me through what was going on. And what was happening was that there was a student who was a, a pretty good student. He was an athlete at the school. And he told me that right now what, what he was trying to do, um, the principal was prevent the school resource officer from arresting that student in the school. And not only embarrassing him, but starting him off um, in terms of the school to prison pipeline and having him encounter um, the the police and an arrest within the school. And the, the action, the arrestable apparently action that had taken place was something that had happened off campus. And this administrator felt that he had a little power over this school resource officer to even try to prevent this situation taking place. And he knew that this student was a good student and that this action could really set him off on a trajectory um, where it would be a challenge for him to sort of um, be on track and be able to reacclimate to the school. And so that was something um, that working through with that principal that just immediately struck me very early on into um, being a, an elected official that we sort of have this um, renegade um, um, sort of program happening in schools that are truly impacting our students. That was one example, but we know it's a systemic issue in Montgomery County. When we look at who was arrested, who was disciplined in our schools compared to um, the population that is in our schools. And so that's one of the reasons that I truly care about this issue. And so the legislation that I'm introducing, which is a complement to, to Delegate Acevedo's legislation, that's a full repeal, um, is that my bill really looks at our budget being our priorities. When you look at any state budget, we look at our own personal budgets, right? If you look at what you spend your money on, that is our priority. And right now, one of the things that we have in the budget is that we give $10 million in every budget towards supplementing school resource officers all across the state. And so what my bill will do is shift those resources to things that we actually want to prioritize, including school counselors, um, trauma, dealing with students and working through and training and making sure that we have processes and best practices in place to support our students who are facing trauma, which is needed even much more right now, restorative justice practices as well, um, making sure that we have both the mental health and the best practices that we actually want to prioritize in our schools, funding those types of priorities. So um, my bill will really make that shift away from the school resource officers. So looking forward to working with this group. You all should know, if you're not aware, that we start, Janu we start session on January 13th. So we need your help. We need your energy. We need your stories. We need you contacting your legislators to let them know that you want to see these bills pass, that you want to see police-free schools. So I want to thank you again for being part of this conversation. And this is just the beginning. We'll meet
need all of your energy to get this legislation passed. So thank you everyone for all of your, your efforts. Thank you to Delegate Acevedo and the coalition. Thank you, Dele Delegates Acevedo and Delegates Wilkins. Um, Delegate Wilkins, I know you, you won't be able to stay with us until the end for the question and answer. And so um, we will share with participants how they can get in touch with you to support your bill. Um, and we will look forward to hearing from Delegate Acevedo a little bit later for the question and answer. Thank you. Thank you. And so we'd like to jump in and get started with our first speaker. Um, you know, just like us adults, we have many, many priorities, so do students. And so um, we are going to hear from Lalani Jones Johnson first from Anne Arundel County, who has another priority. Um, so we need to make sure she has time to share. Can you guys hear me? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Hello. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Um. Hello. My name is Veronica Johnson. Um. I go. To, I'm a seventh grader at Old New Middle North. And the police at school, in my opinion, are not needed. There are many white officers, but not a single black police officer that represents people of color. Um, I was suspended for fighting, which is how I'm able to be here today. And a police officer who was not on the team wrote a report that was based on lies and what other people told him. Me and the girl I got into a fight with were on and off friends. And then one day we got into a fight and I got charged with second degree assault. It wasn't a fight where people had to go to the hospital or get stitches. We didn't even throw punches. The officer that wrote the citation had a friendly relationship with me, like he would give me fist bumps in the hallway. And he said, quote, this doesn't change anything between our relationship, unquote. Of course it changed everything as he had a choice to change or take away the citation and he still chose to write it. After I got the citation, I had to appear in front of a DJS staff member, which was over seven months later. The citation was later removed and replaced as a warning. Many of my peers had other interactions with this school police officer. One interaction that stood out to me the most was one of my, one of my peers was skipping class and the officer was called to take him down to the office. I'm not saying that he should have been classes, but the consequences he got was unnecessary. He got five in-school suspensions for one day. The mindset that many young black teenagers have is that police officers are bad. Most interactions don't feel good with police. A study found that the addition of school police officers led to a 6% increase in, dis in disciplinary actions, including suspensions for middle school students. These suspensions were largely in response to relatively low level offenses and black students were most affected. There were no clear effects on discipline rates for high school students. So do I think that police should be out of schools? Absolutely. Thank you. Lalani, thank you for sharing your experience. Um, and you know, we will continue to hear from you as we're doing this work. And um, thank you. Um, also, good luck this evening to you. Next, we will hear from jo Joanne Jenkins, who is in um, Prince George's County as a parent. Hello, uh, my name is Joanne Jenkins and I'm a parent of a student in Prince George's County. And I'll just tell you briefly what happened to my son. Um, he was in school at the time and him and his friends was discussing money. So one of the teachers assumed that it was a discussion about drug money. In the past, he, he has an IEP. So of course he has had issues with the teachers on behavior and things of that nature but that is why he has a IEP. But nevertheless, she assumed that he was discussing drugs. So she did call the police and they did check him and they did find a small amount of marijuana on him for personal use. But nevertheless, he was arrested for that, taken down to the jail and booked. I had to get a lawyer for him Ms. Jenkins, you are on mute. Thanks. 
And the thing about having police in the schools is that we're sending a message to our children that if you do something that a normal teenager would do, a normal child would do, you're going to be punished. And they don't, they don't take in consideration that if these children were impulsive and made bad decisions, they wouldn't have IEPs in the first place. So having the police there is just a negative. And the two other things I would say before I, um, you know, leave off on it is number one is that no child first encounter with the police should be in the school system. Why are our children having encounters with police officers? So that sends a message to them that police are bad. The one message that we're not trying to sent to our children. And the other thing I want to say in the, in the last thing is that the first speaker talk, spoke about our children as kids, as babies. How often do we hear people refer to our children as babies? I'll tell you, never. Because they don't view them as babies. But what they are, they are babies, they are children, they are kids. And the police in some of the schools that's frustrated, I understand the frustration of the teachers. We have to address that as, as well. The police do not belong in the school system. Those, the money that they spend for the police should, there should be somewhere else. Education, counseling, you know, getting kids mental health, um, um, helping them with their mental health issues. Because what we're doing, we're putting the police in the schools and they're, um, uh, the, 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 the issues, they're growing up and they're taking those issues outside of the schools. And that's, um, and, and, and the last thing was that my son was ultimately acquitted of those charges. But think about this, the embarrassment of being arrested, the school that he missed, his friends seeing him being arrested, that puts a mental toll on our children. And that is something that we have to address and we have to work harder than ever to say no it, it has to change because it didn't just start it has been going on for forever for decades thank you thank you Ms. Jenkins um, for sharing your experience and the experience of your son um, you make a very good point that this impacts so many people just one arrest which is way too many impacts multiple people and multiple people in the community um, in harmful ways. Um, we appreciate you sharing. You're welcome. Next, we will hear from Jason Malara from Montgomery County, Maryland. Hi, everyone. My name is Jason. I'm here to testify. I'm here to tell my story. I'm here to help other students use their voice because this story are not easy to tell. I've been through a lot of things in life and in school, and that's because of the way I look. It's because I'm Hispanic. Police in and out of the schools don't help people like me. If you're black or brown, the police are against you. I learned that right away when I came here to this country at 15 years old. Being an immigrant makes seems police is scary, and then you have to see them in a school every day. It makes us feel unsafe, and I want it. I want police out of the schools. When I was a student in Montgomery County Public High School, I was harassed and made to feel stupid many times by the police in the school. Here are some of my stories. Okay, sorry. I will start with my first experience in American school at 15. I spoke very little English 
and I did not know how to get to my classes. When I asked the uh, officer police in my school for help, they respond by making fun of me, laughing at me, and said, we don't understand you. We don't speak the same language. Go away. The next year, I had a lot of experiences with the police officer in the school. There was a group of students harassing me and threatening me to jump, to jump me all year. I told the officer in the school about many times the officer would not help me because I was Hispanic. And probably in a game, it was like she thought I deserved it. Then four of those students attacked me one day in the hall. I fell back and defend myself because I have no choice. When I, when I was brought to the office, the police officer was there. No one would listen to me. The officer said, you, it's your fault. Look at yourself. You can do nothing. You're a Hispanic piece of shit. I needed someone who cared about me. I needed someone who understood my anger and could help me. There, there was only one teacher who would listen to me and the problem that I had. Being an immigrant, I have experienced very hard things. I was separate from my mom for many years and I lived with my grandma. Then I had to leave my grandmother who was so special to me and moved to another country where everything was new and hard. I was angry at many things and being harassed every day was too much. I told school will help me with some of these things, but they only punished me for my feelings. If it weren't for my teacher, I would be probably in prison today. It is so important that a student have people in schools that they trust and can open up to. And police are not part of this. Please remove the police from all the schools. Thank you for your time. Jason, thank you for your time and for sharing sharing your experience. Um, now I've heard you uh, share this a few times now. Um, I went to the same school that you went to. Um, so, um, you know, this is, a really good uh, example of why having alternatives and solutions that support students um, is really important. You know, there, there are so many things that have happened in schools that can be addressed with counselors or with trauma-informed um, interventions or with, um, uh, with youth development in mind. So we appreciate your time. Next, we will hear from Courtney Houston from Prince George's County. Hi everyone, my name is Courtney. And so I'm gonna start with, I have a few points. <laughs> um, and I've also started working with a student-led organization, um, Stand Up, um, and we're also working together to help with the issue of SROs. So I've learned a lot about it and reflected on my experiences when I was in schools with SROs um, and learned a lot about you know, how negative it was and the long lasting effects it had on me. Um, so the sixth grade, I went to middle school and that was the first time I'd ever been in a school with an SRO before. And in the code of conduct meeting, they have it like the first week of school is where they go through the entire Prince George's County code of conduct and they kind of list all the rules to you. Um, and in a very performative way, they have the SRO in there during that meeting. And when they get to a certain level of infraction or they want to emphasize um, particular rules, they you, they see, you see that officer over there, he'll arrest you. You know, it's like very performative for the administration to have him there and to leverage him against the students. Um, and I didn't think about that until, you know, I got to my, I joined Stand Up and I started thinking about my interactions. Um, but administration continues to do that throughout my entire time in, at that school. Um, whenever someone breaks a rule, gets in an altercation, not a physical altercation necessarily with teachers, but whenever there's arguments um, or whenever there are physical altercations, this person is gonna arrest you. 
And then further than that, he, he patrols the halls with a loaded weapon. He'll pop his head into the classroom. Oh, I'm just making sure everything's okay. Um, very intimidating. And I, I just like parents and, um, you, know, de- you know, elected officials and even school board members as we move forward to understand that administration, and I saw in the comments actually somebody asked about administration, um, they like the SROs are there. Um, they'll say that it's because of school shootings, but really it's because they leverage having the police officer there against students to enforce the code of conduct and their policies. And it's simply not fair because I have to be at that school. I have to be here. Um, And for you to have me arrested for mistakes or my brain literally can't process and function at the same level as an adult, my decision-making is just not, it's simply not there. Um, But you're going to leverage criminal, criminal level offenses against me. You're, you're going to make a mountain out of a molehill just to enforce your policies. That's what the SRO is there for, for the administration. Um, And then I'd also like to mention that the SRO does not just deal with physical altercations. They will be called simply if a teacher cannot control, control a student. Um, And I think that there's a lot of over policing in schools just in the policies. Um, And the story that I thought of after I spoke with um, Ms. Cheryl after our meeting was the hoods. It's a big deal in school for you to wear your hood in class, but sometimes guys will keep their hood on if they don't have a shape up and they don't want to get made fun of, or it's cold um, because they don't pay for the heat soon enough. Um, And I remember when they called the SRO on this um, young man in my class who was black because he had his hood on. Um, and he wouldn't take it off. And so you're gonna call um, a police officer with arresting power to address a 13 year old who was refusing to take his hood off. And so he was removed from class and you just never know what happens after that. Um, But needless to say, he was traumatized simply for the mere fact of trying to control students. That's why the SRO was there, it's not protecting the students is not for school shooters. So I just really wanted to emphasize that to any parents and also the elected officials on the call. And then I'd also like to talk about um, how desperately we need the money that's invested in SROs to be invested into counselors and people who understand how to intervene when students are going through and young people are going through, um, you know, like emotional distress. Um, Cause we simply don't have the skill set to always cope and work through things on our own. And sometimes the physical response is all we know. Um, So I had a friend and she was arguing with another person at the school. And so she was threatening her. And, you know, she basically said, when we get to lunch, I'm going to fight you. Like, I'm going to attack you at lunch. And so my friend didn't want to fight her. And we're taught not to fight. We're taught that if someone says they're going to fight you, you go to the office, you tell someone. Um, So she told administration. They said, we can't do anything for you because you can't prove that she wants to fight you. She then asked to see our counselor and she's in, she's emotionally distressed. You know, somebody's gonna attack her. Um, and our counselor wasn't there that day. Um, and so nothing could be done for her. Um, and just to snip it into the CPS system, if your counselor for your grade isn't there, they very, very rarely give you another counselor. So there were other counselors there, but because ours wasn't, she was out of luck. And then finally she goes to the SRO. And like Jason said, absolutely nothing is able to be done for you. Um, And so what she decided to do before we got to lunch was she just decided to leave school and her mom picked her up um, after she walked out. (laughs) Um, So imagine if instead of paying for the SRO who was able to do nothing (laughs) to be there, you pay for somebody who could intervene in a situation like that. And my last point um, is that when I was filling out college applications this fall, they ask if you've ever had encounters with the police, ever been charged, ever um, been in a situation where you encountered the police. And it's interesting because you like police are in the schools. Um, so I wondered if even that boy who had the hood on would have had to recount to admissions counselors um, 
for higher education, his, inter his interaction with the police, you know, and just out of curiosity, I asked my sister, I was like, do you know what they do with your application? If you have like, how can they judge someone for that? And you know, especially black and African-American and Hispanic kids, we struggle to get into college anyway, simply because of the color of our skin. Um, and she was like, yeah, they're probably not gonna look at that application. So also consider that for students, you're, you're not only impacting their future because you've now put them into the school to prison pipeline possibly, um, but even for those kids who you say, well, at the end of the day, he wasn't charged, he didn't go to jail. If he wants to go to college, he has to recount that. Not only that, but he's, these students could possibly be traumatized for the rest of their life. Um, so thank you for your time and for listening to me. And I'll let us move on. Courtney, thank you for sharing your experience as well. Um, you made many, many good points. Um, and I, I, I really uh, appreciate how you have stressed about uh, having alternatives and solutions really can intervene in uh, substantive ways. Um, and so this is what we hope to see more of so that, uh, you know, as you said, uh, younger brains are still developing. And so there's an opportunity for learning um, and intervention and, and, and solutions. And, 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 you know, so we don't see some of these um, fights or some of the, uh, the behaviors that we see that are normal in high school. I know I saw them almost every day. So <laughs> thank you. And good luck in your college application. Lastly, we'll hear from Gloria Merritt, um, who also shared her experience and also a video, a uh, short video afterwards. Hello, my name is Gloria Merritt. I'm the parent of Jerome Liaison. Uh, we live in Baltimore County in Essex. Uh, Jerome goes to school in Baltimore County. Um, he's, he's artistic. He's 11 years old. He got in an argument um, with a student last year, 2019. Um, and he, they were going to take them to the office. He's artistic, so naturally he got scared. And he fled to an empty classroom because he was scared. So when the um, behavioral interventions finally did get him, um, she called the police to intervene. Okay, so on that note, i like to play a clip from um, the story of Jane Miller with WBAL. Um, they have the video footage of the incident. We can't hear the audio. Jerome Liaison, now 12, has been diagnosed with autism. So in 2019, when he was moving to middle school, his aunt and guardian carefully looked for a school that could meet his needs. General John Stricker Middle School was the choice. And they told us that they could meet his needs. So that's why we chose that school. You have to have a behavior plan uh, for autistic children because, you know, they, they, they act out in different ways than other children. But just a few days into the school year, Jerome got into an argument with another student after he felt he was bullied. As a school employee took him to the office, he ran and then was taken to what's called a focus room. Hi. Calm down. A staff member reported Jerome was banging his head against the wall. Initially, he was restrained by a staff member holding him. But about two minutes later, the decision was made to handcuff Jerome by the school resource officer. This video is from the officer's body-worn camera. Jerome resisted, cursing, kicking, and crying. The handcuffs remained in place for about 23 minutes. His aunt believes it was an unnecessary use of force. It was, it was terrible. It, they treat him like a criminal, and he's only an artistic boy. A spokesperson for the Baltimore County School System defended the officer's response, saying in a statement, 
Physical restraint is allowed when necessary to protect a student or another person from imminent serious physical harm after other less intrusive non-physical interventions have failed. The statement went on, police are called for support in emergency situations and their response is dictated by county police best practices. County police referred to their use of force policy, which applies the same criteria to school resource officers. Handcuff restraint permitted to prevent someone from harming themselves or others. Sam Pulver is the family's lawyer. And what we saw to see in this video and what happened is just a complete systemic failure from, you know, start to finish about the appropriate way to deal with Jerome in this setting. Um, did the sherry on top game that a cop came in and put him in handcuffs, which was just under no circumstances should that ever been allowed to take place. During the incident, Jerome complained of injury to his arm. The following day, he was treated for a broken bone in his right wrist. And to this day, his aunt says, Jerome is afraid of police. If we go to Walmart or somewhere like that, Jerome stays in the car with my husband because he's afraid to even walk past police officers. The family also argues that the school failed to follow Jerome's individual education plan, his IEP, in de-escalating the incident. The family lawyer says a lawsuit is likely to be filed. Reporting live tonight in Dundalk, I'm Jane Miller, WBAL TV 11 News. So as you can see, the school police officer held him down, handcuffed him like he was a common criminal. And the next day, I had to take him to the emergency room where they fractured his wrist. He wore a cast for like 30 days or more. Um, you know, he didn't just get a broken wrist out of all this. He suffered psychological and emotional as well. You know, he's, on, he's artistic. Um, now he's terrified of police. He had nightmares. And, you know, it, it related to the trauma he suffered from the event. I mean, it, it, it was wrong. They did not follow his IEP at all. And I want to thank you for listening to me. I get upset when I see it and when I talk about it. So I'm going to, um, you know, get ready to sign off on this. But I really appreciate everybody listening and, um, and looking at this. Ms. Mayor, thank you for sharing um, your experience and uh, for sharing the video. And you know, this is just unacceptable. Uh, Very unacceptable. This is a hard video to watch. Um, you know, I was thinking about the young people in my life and uh, that, you know, that would be devastating. So you know, I, I appreciate you, sh you taking the time to share this and to, um, for all of you, all of the speakers and the panelists and all of you who have been impacted by SROs and schools for uh, being here with us tonight so we can think about how we're gonna move forward and um, get them out of our schools. We, yeah. we really want to make sure that our youth have an environment where they can learn in the schools to learn and to, to develop. Exactly. So at this point, um, this was our last speaker. And so we will have a few minutes uh, to hear from Monisha before we get into our question and answers. Um, and then we will get into question and answers, uh, primarily for the delegates uh, and for, Mon for Monisha. Thank you. So I wanted to start by thanking and recognizing the incredible courage of our speakers this evening in sharing their stories and their experiences. It's not easy. The stories are powerful and they are only the tip of the iceberg. I'd like to just take a few minutes to flesh out the broader context that Carolyn introduced at the beginning of the evening that demonstrate how the experiences you heard tonight are part of a larger trend and one that we must confront as a state. In 2018-19, the last year for which we have data, 3,141 children were arrested in Maryland public schools, overwhelmingly by school police who patrol the halls of schools in every single district. About 70% of these arrests were for fights not involving weapons and offenses like disruption, minor theft, less. Many are for drug possession, which 
you've heard can be as simple as having a couple grams of wheat. And as you heard, these harms are not suffered equally by all students. 56% of arrests target black students, even though they're only about a third of the student population. And as Carolyn emphasized, there are no differences in behavior that have been shown in any research across race. So national studies tell us that the real reason is that um, it's because we tend to concentrate officers in schools that have greater proportions of black students. 23% of arrests target students with IEPs, even though they're only about 12% of the student population. And again, as you heard in Jerome's story, it's often because children with disabilities are being handcuffed, being arrested for behaviors that uh, arise directly from their medical and de developmental conditions. They may be behaviors that are atypical, but they're behaviors that are part of their disability and as in Jerome's case, oftentimes are not harming anyone at all. So we're arresting kids for having disabilities and we're arresting kids on the basis of our racial biases. And we're arresting kids just for being kids, for making the mistakes that kids make in the places where they're supposed to learn how to become adults. And with each of these arrests, we're pulling kids out of class. We're telling them that school isn't where they belong. We are subjecting them to the emotional and financial burden of navigating the legal system. We're putting them at risk for incarceration and we are leaving them traumatized. And there is no way to justify the harm we're causing. After 20 years of in-depth study, there is no real evidence that the presence of officers prevents school shootings or reduces any kind of violence in schools at all. Some studies have actually found a correlation between increased presence of school police and student behavior problems. In short, the school police model has failed us. It has made schools less safe, not more, particularly for students who are already marginalized. Yet in Maryland, we spend $10 million per year in state funds on top of millions more in local funds to maintain a regular police presence in our schools. Um, it doesn't have to be this way. We know that when you build positive relationships among students and staff at schools, you make it easier to resolve conflict peacefully. When you provide students who have suffered adverse childhood experiences with mental health care, you bring them out of fight or flight mode so that they don't lash out when provoked. When you teach students how to regulate their emotions, how to empathize with others, just in the same ways you would teach them how to read, how to do arithmetic, they learn and violent conduct decreases. So don't let anyone tell you that there's a trade-off between police presence in schools and safety. There is, but it's, we have greater safety when we have police out and other supports in. Now the problem is to implement these strategies that have been shown to work. You need resources, you need social workers, you need counselors, you need school psychologists, you need experts in restorative approaches, community school coordinators, you need trauma-informed practices, and we have not invested our resources in this programming. As a state, Maryland falls short on the recommended ratios for social workers, counselors, school psychologists, nurses across the board. So it's time to reimagine school safety. We need to stop throwing that $10 million per year at the school policing model that has needlessly criminalized children for being children while failing to keep their peers or teachers safe. We need to reinvest that money in student mental health services, in wraparound supports and restorative approaches. We need to get cops out of our schools and we need to do it now, this year, this session, bypassing Delegate Acevedo's legislation, Delegate Wilkins' le legislation, before we lose another child on the pipeline from school to prison. So I think at this point, we have some time um, to address questions that you might all have.
If you do have a question, go ahead and put it in the chat. We'll make sure that chat is accessible and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Just to note, if you had previously put a question in the chat, it was not a public chat yet. Um, so if you had already put a question into the chat, please re-enter it into the chat now that it is open. We have one question that I see already. Um, and so for the participants on the call, just to be clear, uh, we are directing our questions primarily to, uh, for this part of our conversation, to Monisha and to Dele Delegate Acevedo when he returns to back to our call. Um, he had to step away and we'll be back. The first question is, will someone address what position the boards of education around the state have taken on SROs? Also, any positions taken by organization of school administrators, principals? Where are the openings to build on? So I'm happy to start. Um, I will say that this is a, a campaign that many um, throughout Maryland have been pursuing for many, many years, um, but it's only this year um, and that in many districts, school boards and superintendents have really be begun to listen and to hear um, because as a nation, we've been grappling with questions of racial justice, issues that were always there, but got renewed attention this summer with nationwide protests. Um, and in fact, around the country, school board after school board has made the decision in, in Minneapolis, in Oakland, in Charlottesville, in Rochester um, to remove officers from their schools. Um, so with that context, I'll say that some school boards in Maryland have begun to take up the issue, have begun to look at the issue. Um, and for the most part, those who have are at this point more in a, in a, in a studying phase. Um, they're holding task force meetings, they're um, seeking to hear from students and parents in their districts. Um, and if you are a student or parent in Prince George's County, in Montgomery County, in Howard County, um, know that there are active conversations happening within the school boards in your counties. Um, and uh, we can certainly share information about how to be a part of those conversations because they do need to hear from you. Um, but uh, what we expect is that in the second half of the school year, we might start to see some real, um, you know, we might start to see decisions. And, uh, you know, we know that boards vary. Um, we know that individual members of the different boards vary um, in their views on this issue. Um, I think part of the challenge is that we've uh, made school police, um, we've cemented this program into, um, into our education system nationwide and across the state. So, um, so even though I would say the idea of putting um, police in schools in the first place was sort of radical, uh, now um, the, it, it feels like a big shift to get them out. So, so many boards are really grappling with it, but I, bet, I expect that we'll hear um, more definitive decisions or recommendations in the second half of this year. And Monisha, hi everyone. I'm, I'm still mm -hmm. on here um, until about 7.30 I have, to, I have to head to a hearing, but I was able to hear all of the testimony and wanted to thank everyone. I know it's so difficult to share these stories. So thank you for sharing with us and helping to um, drive the, the push for why we need to take these actions. I wanted to use this as an opportunity to just point out something regarding the legislative process. Um, once we introduce these bills, we have not introduced them yet. We are tightening up um, the language in them and making sure it's all together and right um, before we introduce them once this, the session starts. And every bill gets a hearing. So at some point in the next couple of months, um, every person who's interested can come and share their support for this bill and their opposition for this bill in the same way that you all just testified before us. It'll be a virtual format where people will share their support or their opposition for these bills. And when it comes to the superintendents, 
when it comes to other school leaders, the superintendent's association will absolutely send in their support or opposition. I don't know at this point where they, where they stand on the issue, but various associations like the ones that have men been mentioned um, will have the opportunity to weigh in and their opinions do matter to my committee members. So one of the things that you all can do is that you all are um, you know, under the jurisdiction of a board of education. So you can contact your board of education, your superintendent, and make sure they're aware of your support for this legislation so that their association can more likely be in support of the bill. So I just wanted to use that as an opportunity just to point out um, something about the legislative process and how your voice and your support can help influence and that you all can also come testify when the moment comes. So I'll put a link to where the bill will be available available um, once we introduce it. I expect to introduce it on the first day of session, which is January 13th. So maybe that week you can check out the, the website and click on Gabriel Acevedo's name under members, click on my name under members, then you can see the bills that we've introduced. That's where you can um, find these. I know there's a question about me the mental health provisions as well. Thank you. Um, I apologize. I thought you you were not on the call. And so thank you for clarifying and answering. No problem. Um, and yes, the next question that we did have uh, was around uh, where to find uh, resources around mental health options. Did this person mean in the in the bill they're referring to um, where to find the the mental health options that are that are within the bill basically the bill will create a fund um so that 10 million dollars will go into a fund that will include um opportunities for jurisdictions to get resources for mental health services that they can use in their jurisdictions for school counselors um for restorative justice and so in terms of seeing the exact language that we'll have um, when we introduce the the bill on on or around january 13th that's when you'll be able to see those specific provisions um so if you were talking about where in the the bill that's where it is thank you uh, we appreciate your time you know you have to go um and so now you really are leaving the call <laughs> So th again, thank you. And we will Everybody. definitely be in touch looking uh, leading up to January 13th. Yes, absolutely. The next question. Thank you for very powerful advocacy. I deeply support the legislative efforts. My question is this. There is incredible opposition to eliminating SROs and hugely increasing fiscal investment in healers of all kinds in schools. How are the good people who are developing the legislation also creating engagement with people who disagree and who default to school policing? Also, how can longtime educators and nonprofit leaders like myself become involved in these coalitions? We have deep experience actually teaching de-escalation, disability interventions, anger management, fear management, and trauma-informed care. I think there's a lot, that's a great question. Um, and there are so many opportunities to get involved and be part of this campaign. Um, as I mentioned, there's two broad coalitions um, that help to set up this particular event um, and are involved in the, the push um, for statewide legislation, as well as support for local efforts to get police out of schools and reinvest um, in the other supports we've been discussing. Um, so we'll put their names in the chat, but the two coalitions are the Maryland Coalition uh, to Reform School Discipline and the Maryland and Coalition, Coalition for Justice and Police Accountability, which is also focused on police reform more broadly at the state level. Um, you can check them out on social media and, um, and reach out so that you can become involved in those coalitions. They're both large coalitions and welcome members who share the mission of um, of reducing the over-policing of, um, of our communities. Um, I'm also happy to share um, my uh, contact information um, in the chat. Um, anyone who is interested in, in participating in the legislative effort, whether it's uh, by testifying at hearings, um, by meeting with your lawmakers, um, participating in public education events like this one, um, we welcome your partnership, we welcome your support, we welcome having a lot of different perspectives. We need to hear from the folks who are directly impacted as we did today. Um, we also need to hear from folks who know how to 
um, keep kids safe um, without police, right? Um, so if you are a nonprofit leader or an educator who has experience um, uh, and has seen how trauma-informed teaching really um, does reduce instance of conflict, you need to be at the table and you need, you need to be able to share that experience with folks um, who have the false impression um, that if you take police out of schools, our schools will, will erupt in violence. Um, so um, to the two coalitions, um, and I'll um, drop in the chat my contact information um, because I'm more than happy to connect you with, with all the different folks who are, who are working this capacity and plug you into the legislative effort. Thank you. Uh, we don't have too many more questions. I'm going to read a couple of comments. In Montgomery County, the principals want the cops to stay. Thank you, Zakia, for bringing this up. Um, we, <laughs> we have uh, been working on this issue locally um, in Montgomery County, and there was a study that recently came out that suggested that uh, principals in Montgomery County, that all principals in Montgomery County were supporting um, keeping SROs. Um, I, I personally know some principals who are not in support, so you know I, I wonder about that study. Um, but it is a good point to notice that where, where we are in community in terms of this issue. Um, and one second as I'm scrolling, just to make sure that I've gotten all the questions. I have a question that was sent to me. Um, this person yes. asked, where is the line drawn by the head of security and the SROs? Their son was involved in a fight, was attacked uh, years ago, and the head of security banned next from questioning the bus driver because they stepped on the steps of the bus, and they were then banned from school property for a year. So, um, I can try to address that, at least in general terms. Um, I think the, the questioner is correctly pointing out that um, most districts, likely all districts, have, um, in addition to SROs, um, school security guards. Um, and in at least one of those districts, Prince George's County, those security guards actually have arrest power. So they essentially function as a, as a shadow additional police force. Um, what I'll say um, with respect to the legislation, um, that Delegate Acevedo and Delegate Wilkins are pursuing. Um, th that legislation would not um, require school districts to remove security guards so long as they do not carry firearms um, or have arrest powers, i.e., um, if you have, you can't have security that, that essentially are the same as cops, um, but you can have security who, you know, are presence um, at the front door to screen visitors, to, um, you know, to address uh, any outside safety concerns um, and, and so forth. Um, I'm not sure I understand the sort of specifics of, of the scenario involving, um, involving the child, um, but I do want to clarify um, for purposes of everyone understanding the legislation that, um, that the, the legislation would allow uh, districts to have guards, but would ensure that guards are not acting as cops and would ensure that guards have training on de-escalation, on um, cultural competence, um, and that we would, we would collect data on the interactions between security guards and students um, and, so that we can uncover um, problems or instances of um, guards um, you know, mistreating students um, or, you know, using force on students and so forth. Thank you. Do you have other questions? Bethany, I don't have other questions um, in the chat. Okay. I want to make sure that everyone has uh, had the opportunity to ask a question that they'd like to. Um, so we'll wait just a couple of uh, just about a minute or so to see if there are any other questions. I know it doesn't, um, it's not very easy to type quickly. I, I see that someone, someone asked, were there really 3,000 kids arrested in Maryland schools? Um, or did you say that 3,000 kids were arrested? Yes, um, 3,141. 
um, in the 2018-19 school year. This is from data um, reported by school districts to MSDE, the State Department of Education. Um, MSDE then issues an annual report on school arrests um, each year. And that's how we know um, about our disproportionality figures. That's how we know that most arrests in school are for fights without weapons and disruption. Um, and the other types of um, more minor offenses that we um, discussed. One last question that I've just received is, is there a link for the Maryland Coalition for Justice and Police Accountability? So this coalition, um, yeah, we will um, provide um, some social media information um, for the coalition. Um, what I would actually suggest, um, um, if you want sort of immediate information um, uh, on social media for the MCJPA um, is to follow um, ACLU of Maryland, um, which has been one of the leaders in the coalition, has been doing a lot of social media um, for that coalition. Hi, Monisha, uh, this is Nicole. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to let everyone know that I put a link in the chat for the campaign page that you basically mm -hmm. were just mentioning. Yes. Thank you, Nicole. So we don't have any more, I don't, oh wait, one more question. Would the bill repeal state requirement for law enforcement cover coverage for would the bill would the bill repeal state requirements for law enforcement coverage for schools? No. So um, so nothing in the bill would prohibit school districts from coordinating with outside police um, so that they can call an officer um, and get help in an emergency. Um, what it would change is that you would not have police. Um, just regularly present in schools patrolling the hallways um, because that's where we really see um, uh, it's, it's almost um, when, you know there's the saying when all you've got a, it is a hammer everything looks like a nail right when you have an officer there on site at all times it is very easy to default to relying on that officer to remove a student um, whenever there's any whiff of trouble or possible trouble or the appearance that maybe a student will get into trouble, right? Um, um, whereas if you um, are simply relying on, um, on and, 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 and let me back up and say actually that that part of that is because it's, it's not just, you know, I think we sometimes hear that um, this is a question of training or it's a question of making sure we're, you know, um, selecting SROs that, that are well suited towards students. Um, no doubt there are some SROs that could benefit from additional training, but I wanna be very clear that training alone, selection alone um, will not solve this problem because at bottom, the job of an SRO is a police, police officer. They're for the most part employees of the police departments who have the exact same obligations um, and um, and powers as all police. Um, and one of those obligations is to view the world through the uh, lens of the criminal law and to conduct arrests when they see anything that could violate the law. So a fight um, in the eyes of an officer is an assault, right? Um, running off with someone's backpack in the eyes of an officer um, is a theft or a robbery. Um, so, you, so you see where I'm going. Um, with um, the unavoidable problem that results when you have police consistently on campus seeing kids do all the things that kids do. Um, we, we don't have that same problem if we simply have a system in which administrators can call the outside police um, to respond in, you know, say that, you know, the, the instance of a, of a, a real outside threat. Um, and we have every reason to believe that would be just as effective because as you heard earlier, um, having police on site has has not succeeded in um, addressing school shootings or in um, reducing any kind of on site violence at all. So that that option of of calling in an outside officer in an emergency, um, you know, should should address those concerns. Um, I see another question here. Are there plans for staffing and handling and mitigating issues needing social workers or others? that would be presented to school boards. 
Um, so I'm not 100% sure I, I understand the question, but um, if, if, if this is really about um, what proposals are out there to um, expand social work coverage for schools, that's very much part of the bill. Um, the bill would call on districts to move towards meeting those professionally recommended ratios for social workers to students, um, as well as counselors to students, um, psychologists to students, um, and and um, and so forth. So it would call on it would provide districts with with money to invest in those positions, and it would call on them to report on the progress they're making towards. Um, having an appropriate number of, of these types of mental health professionals for their um, student body. We have a comment as well. Um, Zikia made a comment uh, in the chat that I'd like her to, to talk a little bit about. Uh, Zikia, do you mind sharing? No, I was just responding to the person that um, I believe it was the question that Manisha was answering around, will the, the new bill like I guess to repeal the current bill that requires law enforcement in schools or something like that. I've heard that come up on several of these statewide calls and other calls as well. There's an interpretation um, that the law requires actual police like on campus all the time. And I said, that's an interpretation of the law. The law from my understanding requires the school district to do a safety plan Mm -hmm. I think people automatically jump to safety, meaning cops, and that's not explicitly in the bill, is what I was trying to say. Yeah, the the um, the law says uh, the law currently says that a school can either have an SRO on site or an adequate law enforcement coverage plan, i.e., a plan to coordinate with outside law enforcement uh, to respond in an emergency. And the bill would. Um, take away the option or you know it would um, shift us away from using SROs but would still include the language around um, an adequate law enforcement coverage plan. Do we have any other questions? Bethany or Monisha? I don't see any others. Okay. Um, but um, what we'll do is we will actually um, follow up with everyone who registered with an email that contains a fact sheet on the legislation um, and information about the social media handles and um, coalitions and members organizations within various coalitions that you can follow um, in order to stay informed in the pro process, get involved um, as session opens up. As Delegate Wilkins said, it's right around the corner. Um, and you know, we'll be. It, it'll take all of us to really uh, achieve a change um, during during the general assembly session in January. Absolutely. Um, we just got a comment um, from Miss Tree Turtle uh, around healing, um, and I wanted to know if you wanted to talk a little bit about that. If you wanted to share anything, you're on mute. Thank you. I wanted to say that. I'm so grateful for the advocacy this evening. It has been incredibly important. I've been working on this area since 1986. I've been so dismayed at the amount of resistance. Only in the last three years have we actually been making progress. I specialize within demonstrating how incredibly effective interventional and also pre-interventional, meaning pre-silient, making a culture of disability awareness and trauma-informed care can actually be. I would, for example, take the, the video that the incredible parent of the autistic son and look at that hard prison-like room with the cushion in the back and walk through how that intervention could have unfolded if there was more investment in talking about healing practices that actually work. We need the messaging to be more effective, to move from the training, from merely training in an adjunct way to a full body and 
incredibly engaging and persuasive approach to change culture. We also need more black voices like me who've been public school teachers, and I'm also a nurse, talking from our experiences to say, we got this and we can get this. So tap into the resources that, that are here and take these opportunities for networking as serious opportunities to band together for this legislation. This is long, long overdue. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, and it's so true. Um, healing work and culture change is uh, in particularly important um, to me. It's a focus of mine as well. Um, and it is a part that we often don't talk about when we're talking about uh, preventing the harm or stopping the harm. But there's another side of it um, about restoring and trans transformation. Um, so I appreciate your comments. Um, thank you for all of you who have participated, who have stayed with us, who have listened. Um, there are a number of you who uh, we will be reaching out to. Um, you've indicated that you'd like to stay in touch and chat. Um, so we're looking forward to working with you and talking to you long, uh, a little bit more. Um, January 13th, keep that date in mind. Uh, we are looking forward to working with you again and thank you for your time. Have a good evening. <laughs>